Welcome to another edition of Anglican Unscripted, episode 783. I'm Kevin Coulson. I'm George Conger. Today's January 20th, 2023. All right, thank you for joining us on another episode of Anglican Unscripted. We're glad you could be here. Before we get too far into the program, this would be a wonderful time to like the program on Facebook or YouTube. You don't have to determine whether or not you like it, because you do. We, we know you do. You're, you're here because you love us. We appreciate that. A lot of you people who watch the show don't know we come in a podcast-only format as well. You can find that in the show notes where you can click on a link and it will sign you up for the podcast so you can download it and enjoy us while you're driving or going to the gym or whatever. The show continues far after we hit the stop button on our recording uh, software here. It continues in the comments, and we appreciate if you go to the comments and add your thoughts about what we're talking to. This is going to be a big week for comments because we're going to talk about uh, the Church of England and deciding to go halfway, halfway to hell. Ah, we know. We'll, we'll talk about that in a minute. Uh, George, how are you doing this week? Very busy week. Uh, I want to thank one of our viewers, sent the information about the foster care opportunities and I looked into it. It's not a match for what me need, but it started us on the prog uh, process of basically becoming a resource uh, center for foster care needs in the county, working with this organization and others like it to reach the, the children in need in our community. And I mean, this is the wonderful thing about Anglican Unscripted. You know, we could go down these different trails and to come up with information and things that really can bless us in many many different ways so thank you very much uh, yeah keep i said it coming. at least two or three times a year somebody reaches out uh with information about something that becomes a new ministry uh, to either one of us and uh, that's really appreciative of how the audience has uh contacted us when they said i know something you need to know and boom we're there uh lots happening in the around the world we'll get to that in a minute but you know what's happening here in florida sunshine 73 degrees and i'm watching I know it's freezing kevin 73 I'm, I'm, I'm cold i got my jacket off freezing I, I i got little sweat beads up here you know it's it's all subjective but uh uh i was watching some youtube about the snow in the midwest and the storms and uh, uh downpours in california and so like in florida right now won't like it in about four months. Be too hot to, to stay here. Um, let's move on to the news. Number one story. Let me go look on my show notes. Uh, the Church of England. Indian, corru Indian corruption, number one story. Uh, okay, hold on. This is probably, it, it certainly is corruption, uh, but it's more spiritual corruption and heresy. But the Church of England will bless but not conduct same-sex uh, weddings and civil partnerships and stuff like that. Uh, after a long process with the living love and faith discussions and people are tuning in here kevin george what do you think and i think we'll start with you george because they just had a press uh, conference this morning laying this out well the living and lust and fear progress uh, love and faith progress excuse me concluded with the house of bishops issuing their recommendations which were uh, formally introduced today the bishops met on Wednesday and sort of nailed these down. And I think our discussion is really going to follow a path. What they said, what the reaction is, and what sort of happens now. Because these are all three different uh, topics. What they said, do not read the secular newspapers because the headlines are all wrong. The headlines of almost all the papers out there say, Church of England will not bless gay marriages. That is not true. They Correct. will not conduct gay marriages, but they will bless civil marriages and civil partnerships. So the Church of England has taken several steps. It has rescinded or retired, as they like to say, issues in sexuality, the 1991 Statement and Guidance on Human Sexuality, which is that human sexual relations are properly found in husband, wife, male, female marriage, which is permanent, uh, which is the Lambeth Conference Statement Standard from 1998. The Church of England has dropped that. 
And that means that uh, partnered gay clergy must no longer be celibate. Well, not must not, was, but can choose not to be. Cho can choose not to be celibate. Mm -hmm. Well, I'll pause here in the description to just give a little observation. This has been one of the great uh, farces of the English church over the past 10, 15 years that uh, uh, we, recently we talked about the uh, dean, former dean of Montreal who's a big public advocate for homosexual marriage and relations in Canada, comes back to England. He's now the interim dean of uh, Chelmsford and uh, he hasn't changed. He's still got his partner with him, but mm -hmm. because the bishop there didn't ask him whether he was actually sexually active, he therefore is deemed not to be, even though he's a campaigner in Canada. It was kind of a uh, don't ask, don't tell policy. Don't uh, tell policy. Up until this point, they don't have to have that anymore. They don't have to lie openly about whether or not they're having sexual relationships with their same-sex partners. Now, we always held them up and said, you would not allow this type of relationship between a male and female roommates in the same house. Why are you allowing it be, uh, between same-sex couples? And they just kept up with their, their hyperboil. Well, I don't want to get too far away from the facts, so we'll get back to the commentary. Uh, uh, so point one is rescinding issues in human sexuality. Mm -hmm. Point two, the bishops will come up with rights for the blessing of same-sex civil marriages, liturgical rights. And then they go on to say, but we are not changing the doctrine of holy matrimony. Ma holy matrimony is between one man, one woman, and that's what we perform in church. Blessing of same-sex civil unions, that's not marriage. We're not... So, so those are the three steps. And then we've got some sort of filler that followed afterwards. The Bishop of Chelms, uh, Bishop of Southwark, Christopher Cheshire, who happens not to be at the meeting, he's been in Jerusalem on a uh, junket, said that, uh, well, no matter what synod does, I'm, we're going to go ahead with gay uh, gay rights. And then the Bishop of London says, well, we don't really need synod's approval because the way we're wording this is that since we're not changing doctrine, we can actually add supplemental rights that sort of uh, conform to current doctrine. So the Church of England is saying simultaneously, the bishops of the Church of England are saying simultaneously, we're conforming to current doctrine. Nothing is changing where that marriage is between one man and one woman and sexual relations are properly confined to marriage, we're changing that to you can have sexual relations with your same-sex partner, but we're not changing that. I mean, it, this has been the major criti criticism from people like Lee Gaddis and the Church Society and commentators on the conservative side. That this is just, this is another r step in the hypocrisy trail that uh, the actually, Church of England has been following for the, all these years. There was a word that was made just for this type of situation. It's called oxymoronic. You know, of course you can't have the same two things. Well, we want the same two things. No. You know, this is as Georgia said, it's absolutely crazy. And uh, the, the, the fact that they're not being called out by conservative bishops publicly uh, tells me a lot about the weakness that's going on behind the scenes, George. Yeah, exactly, Kevin. And actually, at the press conference today, uh, Justin Welby released a film, to, and the, the other bit was a, an apology to the gay community from the bishops for the mistreatment they've received at the hands of the church over the years, mm -hmm. which follows the apology to the Sikhs for the Amritsar massacre, to the uh, West African slave trade, to the... Uh, you know, goes on and on and on and on and on. You know, the Welby Apology Tour. Sure. It, and the, that also, and then in his uh, press conference today, Stephen Cottrell, the Archbishop of York, said he is enthusiastically going to start blessing these same-sex relationships. Justin Welby said, well, I will not be blessing them. I, I support the position we've taken that we can now bless them, but I won't do it myself. So he is a hypocrite. That's not a surprise, Kevin. That's not new. That's, <laughs> just, that's on page 12 of our newspaper. <laughs> that's beneath the fold, yes. Well, but here's, here's that problem. 
Uh, Justin Welby has, for the longest time, says, I am the Archbishop of Canterbury who is going to bring unity, who is going to keep the, the, the band together, so to speak. And he's tried for the last dozen years to do just that. Uh, he wanted to keep the Global South happy. He wants to keep GAFCON at arm's length, but happy. Uh, but most of all, he doesn't want to wake up one morning and find that there's an alternative leadership in the Anglican Communion. Uh, he doesn't want to find uh, that there's successful GAFCON uh, developments on the shores of the UK. And I don't think he understands that this is the issue. This is the issue that tore the fabric of the uh, communion with the Episcopal Church. This is the issue that's going to uh, further tear and uh, forever sever uh, the leadership ties of the Anglican Communion as imported by the, uh, the Sea of Canterbury. Well, at the same time, this is his stance of personally not blessing but backing the program is entirely consistent with his highest goal of that of unity. He will not offer a personal opinion on the issue uh, because he wants to be seen as a focus of unity. So within the Church of England, he will continue to claim to represent the evangelical cause, of course, which he's abandoned. Uh, but at the same time, he will not, and therefore by not performing these rites, but at the same time, he'll allow them to take place to accommodate the left. And now he can say to the wider Anglican communion, I, I, I'm friends, I couldn't stop this, but I myself am abstaining. I'm not doing it. They may be doing it all around me, but don't blame me for what the Church of England has done uh, because I've said uh, I won't do it myself. But, but if memory serves, Roland Williams was able to stop what he did not want to have happen in the House of Bishops of the Church of England. Mm -hmm. Why, well, why this can't is, Justin do the same? Well, because he doesn't want to stop. One of the things, the Bishop of Manchester has put out an ad clarum, a letter to his clergy, saying that uh, we couldn't reach the two-thirds margins necessary at General Synod and among the bishops to have gay marriage. So this is the best we're going to get right now. And this is the attitude that the Archbishop of York is taking. This is a step on the way towards gay marriage. Let's take what we have been given, consolidate our position, and in a few years move a few f feet further down the road till we get across the goal line. Um, this is a political uh, step taken. Now, the left is livid. They're just as mad and actually they're probably madder than the conservatives are oh they yeah absolutely absolutely betrayal. yeah they believe this is a betrayal they thought they were going to get gay marriage they had been promised this that if they you know play nice they'll get this and they've been told now they they interpret this the same way the conservatives do as hypocrisy um you're not worthy of being married in the church because it's still a sin, but we'll bless you anyway to keep you out of our hair, is how they're hearing this. So the campaign for equal marriage, uh, Jane Ozen, the uh, uh, noted uh, gay activist, are just livid and screaming blue murder about uh, the betrayal and the, uh, the fraudulent steps taken by the bishops. And to be fair, she has every right to be upset by this. You know, mm. y years ago, the, the liberals and, and the left in the Church of England and certainly the Anglican Communion planned a way that we will just kick this down the road and talk about it. We will introduce Indaba to the primates meetings and we'll have Indaba meetings with uh, the archbishops of all these provinces and sooner or later we will beat them down just by talking this to death. And if any province in the last five years was going to finally endorse uh, same-sex marriage and uh, civil unions, not just blessing, but having uh, uh, services within the church, it would have been the Church of England. And if you can't get the Church of England to do it, after all this browbeating over a dozen years, who are you going to get to do it besides, you know, tech? So we're now faced with a situation where the General Synod has been told that they're going to be bypassed because the bishops 
are going to interpret this with the advice of their lawyers as not being a change to doctrine so that General Synod doesn't have any business discussing this. They are be, they, so General Synod is going to be livid because the bishops are going to try to sort of shove something down their throats. And the bishops are probably short-term wise because the last time the bishops tried to do something, General Synod rejected it. The liberals and the conservatives got together and said no. So where, where are we at all? So we have this the status quo the facts on the ground the years of of turning a blind eye to partner day clergy we now no longer can have to, to pretend it's not happening and the thing is this is not just done in liberal diocese when nt wright was bishop of durham he had a number of gay clergy and wright will write all these things and say all these things but as a bishop he was dreadful in upholding the ministry of the episcopacy and basically enforcing standards and almost every diocese i would assume every diocese has this situation of clergy whom we wink wink nod nod they're celibate and you know relationships and all this and that but they're not sexual now we can stop pretending we have two bishops who are in this position of public same-sex relationships one in the civil partnership the other uh a woman uh yeah n i don't think it's uh been publicly solemnized but you know they own ha prop their house together properly as partners and all this and that so is uh, so in essence we soon will have by the back door uh non-celibate gay bishops who are now allowed to be gay bishops because they no longer must conform to issues in human sexuality so that sort of back or legalization of the status of the existing facts on the ground so all this has taken place but the liberals it's not far enough the conservatives it's too far for the bishops the the blob and the Welbyites. it preserves the union and we can go forward um it is a pretty big mess. No, it's a very big mess because 25, 30 years ago, this is the mess that the Episcopal Church took on. You know, they slowly mm -hmm. went through this uh, uh, kind of putting the frog in hot water and slowly turning up the heat until the point where uh, the church had no choice but to adopt these strange new doctrines. And to the fact that we're now, and Canada went the same way. Uh, Church of England is, is falling in their footsteps to the point where what is going to happen in five or ten years? If we look at the Episcopal Church, they will soon adopt uh, a gay marriage platform and slowly introduce it to their prayer books and uh, uh, other mythologies. Well, here's the problem in the Church of England. Um, in the United States, the conservative factions were pretty clear cut. I mean, you knew who was in and who was out. For instance, the Society, which is the group of Anglo-Catholic bishops who will not ordain women, has among its ranks two partnered gay bishops. Now, this is all only Hush. this is known to everybody. <laughs> you know, this is known to everybody, but it is not public like the Bishop of Grantham, who's in a public same-sex relationship. But that's chaste, of course. Um, so among the conservatives you've got basically people who i don't want to call them fifth columnists but they cannot be counted on to stand up and be counted and in fact no conservative i've i've read half a dozen ad clarum letters in the last two days from the english bishops about what how they support this this is wonderful and this and that i've not seen anything for the conservatives and we have to ask why why are they silent? Have they bought into this? Are they waiting for this whole edifice to basically tumble under the assault from the left so they don't have their fingerprints on the dead body, on the knife in the back of the dead body? I don't know what, I quite don't understand what's going on. Or they like the society, which could says we will we'll need, you know, the society, we will need to look at detail at these rights before we can comment and approve them. How can an Anglo-Catholic worth, you know, ask Jack Eicher or Keith Ackerman 
uh, in the United States, do you need to look at the blessing rites before you will comment on them? Or is the idea in and of itself a problem? The society can't even say that's a problem. They can only say, well, we need to consult and look further. Um, there are no good short-term options right now for the conservatives. And frankly, we're seeing the typical conservative pattern of fiercer battle within the conservative ranks than against the enemy. Because we seem now to be seeing two parallel conservative options. And if you will, these this is a very loose thing. One is the GAFCON option. Mm -hmm. which is withdrawal from the Church of England, get out, join the AMIE or any of the other groups that are forming Anglican Network in England, Anglican Network in Europe, Anglican Mission in England, and just leave the Church of England, and you'll be affiliated with GAFCON, like Calvin Robinson, the noted commentator on TV in England. Uh, he left the Church of England for the Free Church of England, but not really for the Free Church of England, but for GAFCON. Sure. And then we have what I would call the more global South option, which is at this stage, stay and stay, fight, stay and fight. And we, the archbishops of South Sudan and the Indian Ocean and Chile and places like that, will have your back. And we will do our best to pressure the bishops to give you the space that you need. And the so the, 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 the two conservative, they agree that there's a problem. They disagree on the solution and their arrows are now being fired at each other. Well, if you're a coward, you don't want to walk away. Well, you're foolish. Why should we give up what we've built all these years? In other words, the strength of the fight is now internecine among the right. And so that's the one thing that you can count on the liberals, that there are no enemies on the left in the uh, a, uh, church world. But for the uh, you know, it's just like the Episcopal Church in the United States. Uh, the Anglican, the Anglican Communion Partners, bills itself uh, as being a, a uh, you know, hope for the future. But to ask Bill Love where they were when he got in trouble, yeah, or hey. uh, or will they? Will they? In other words, it, it's it's a self-selected. It, it's it's like kids on the plate on the uh, playground. They're little gangs, and they can't get their act together to perform one group. We can't do it in the Episcopal Church. How could he, why should we think the Church of England could do it? The great, greatest moments within church history are when there is a common enemy. And it's hopefully, you hope that's on each other. Catherine Jefferts Shorey, perfect example. You know, the, she, she became a, a common enemy of those who uh, were seeking to work within um, the Episcopal Church. It didn't work out. She started opposing them. Um, but she was that common enemy. I'll disagree with you slightly. The slightly. greatest yeah, moment, just a little slightly. slightly. No, I'm going to flip it. I agree okay, with sure. the, the principle, but I'm going to turn it around. Mm -hmm. Because now do you see how special and how active the Holy Spirit was in raising up Bob Duncan at a mm -hmm. certain time and in a certain Absolutely. place? Sure, yeah. Because, you know, the Episcopal Church before the great crack up was just like the Church of England. Ford and Faith didn't talk to these people, the Anglican, you know, the uh, Todd, uh, Wex Wex Todd Wexels, Episcopalians United yeah. didn't talk, you know, we were all tribally based. And then Bob Duncan, amazingly, you know, providentially was able to bring together a disparate group of people to stand together. And so the ACNA today, if let off the loo leash, the ACNA would devour itself. The Todd Hunter team would go all woke in CRT, and some of the Anglo Catholics uh, would go all get their knives out over women, and uh, some of the evangelicals would I get would all. Say, yeah, Reformed Episcopal would probably that, leave. Yeah. yeah, that you know all of this stuff. If the discipline and and, ex and the leadership of not only Bob Duncan but now Foley Beach two generations of leadership or two iterations of leadership have kept a disparate thing together and this is a, this is the, the the tragedy of the church of england is that you know michael nazarelli could have done this he didn't he chose to you know take the parachute and go to rome 
uh, Bishop Hind of, uh, oh, I want to say Winchester, uh, that, but that wouldn't be right, of uh, Chichester. Yeah. He could have he could have done that. We could have had, and we, Julian Henderson could have done this, but he's now retired, and the Church of England Evangelical Council is playing a deep game, they say. Stay and fight. That's a valid point. So it's a real mess, and we're just waiting for a leader to arise. And But again, Kevin, you know, I look at my own Episcopal diocese and Episcopal election. And the path of least resistance is the one that's almost always taken. People don't want to rock the boat. They like the status quo. They okay. like, if it's not, if my house is, my neighbor's house may be on fire, but so long as I have a dike between me and them and a, or a, or a, a stream between that fire's not gonna jump across that dike or that, that stream. Well, but so Central Florida, Central Florida voted to continue to be a little redoubt with its back turned to the world, mm -hmm. rather than one of the other candidates was someone who was going to fight the good fight and uh, stand for, you know, truth, truth, justice in the American way, and have a big blue, blue but, cape, red cape with a blue suit on. But anybody who's watched the church wars over the last twenty years would look and say, "Is that worth it?" There's churches who went through the uh, the, the last church war, and I can think of. Uh, certainly mm -hmm. diocese of south carolina where at the end they're like it wasn't worth it most churches think it was worth it but there's so many after the exhaustion after your vestries being brought up in federal charges after losing your church building after the you know, a, a wonderful full attending church is now at 20 percent and broke because they have to fight all these some churches come to the conclusion and certainly observers from other dioceses i don't think it's worth that much trouble why don't we just serve in our local parish, keep our heads down. When the bishop comes by, we give him his little tie check and shake his hand and let him do some confirmations. Uh, keeping your head down is a long established Episcopal precedent. Well, it's the way we operate. Uh, I've been here, this will be my ninth year starting September, and I've had three visits from the bishop in those nine years. And, you know, once every three years is fine for me. Mm -hmm. We don't get any money from the diocese. We don't get any program materials. We don't have any, you know, there's nothing. The diocese basically gets us good rate. It's like being a member of AAA. We get good rates on towing <laughs> and insurance. But, you know, and there's certainly no uh, oversight in the sense of uh, knowing that I've got somebody I can call upon if I have sure. an issue. Mm -hmm. You know, essentially, we're, we're effectively... Uh, congregationalists uh, who are paying kicking 10% to the big guy upstairs or the big guy down in Orlando. So, you know, and for my congregation, that's fine with them mm -hmm. because we're able to live and do the things that are important. No, it's more important for us to take care of orphans in the community than it is to fund uh, a gay literacy output, you know, whatever the National Church's latest, greatest kookiness is. Wait, latest, greatest kookiness? That's a transition into the Church of Wales, if I've ever heard one. Yeah. Let's talk yeah. about that, George. Well, the Church of Wales elected a new bishop, Mary Stollard, to be Bishop of Flandiff. And this has been a dis I don't want to say all, but most of the dioceses in the Church in Wales have been dysfunctional for a long time. Uh, Barry, 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 Barry Morgan, the former Archbishop, was one of these guys. He was a spider in the middle of a web, and he put his people into positions of power across the Church in Wales. And this church has fallen farther, faster. It just, ah. Uh, I think the ACNA is like 10, 15 times as big. Um, it's just, well, it's a problem church. And Mary Stollard, whose nickname on the internet, on uh, chat groups is the Poison Dwarf. I don't well, know if that's... Well, hold, hold on. You have a bishop with a nickname? That's kind of cool. Yeah. yeah. Well, there's one bishop called the Chocolate Teapot. Um <laughs> And then there's a poison dwarf, but mm -hmm. the poison dwarf was the assistant bishop for the archbishop 
uh, Andy John, who, according to the latest story I read, has managed to run out 47 members of his clergy from his diocese of Bangor over his tenure. And, you know, I think there are only like 60, 70 clergy in that place to begin with. He's ran off 47 of them because of his incompetency. His, he said, I needed an assistant bishop because my work is so onerous to minister to the 3,000 people coming to church every Sunday in all my parishes and being archbishop. So they gave him an assistant, even though the, all the studies show that the Church of Wales should merge their diocese because they have too many bishops for the number of people they have. He needed an assistant, and the assistant, who is a, she may very well be a pleasant woman. I don't know. I've never met her. Don't know her. But the comments from the clergy where she was was that, you know, her name, the name for her was the Poison Dwarf. And she was elected, and she'll be installed. And do we see any change of the trajectory of the Church of Wales into ruin and irrelevance? Well, they are going to spend $100 million on uh, $100 million pounds on uh, evangelism and outreach, which I think means hiring consultants. Yeah, and uh, in fact, I, I, you, friends you, and that. You, you and I should offer our time. I would gladly take a hundred million pounds to help them out of their problem. Um, but, you know, money isn't the answer, George. Um, avoiding these strange and erroneous doctrines that they keep implementing would really help a lot. Um, next on our long list of stories we have uh dr stephen no is put out a 14 thesis that he'll be uh discussing over the the next uh, uh several weeks and the cool thing is as an ex-lutheran i love theses in dealing with problems uh you find within your church and uh but i do remember reading uh spong's book about theses and he can't hit it wrong, <laughs> so <laughs> let, let yeah. that thesis be well, the, the uh, unexpected interpreter here. Well, this is a shameless plug for Stephen Knoll and for Anglican Inc., because as sure. he comes out with each of the explanations of the 14 theses, we'll put them up on our website. Yeah. And But Dr. Knoll, uh, Professor Knoll, he essentially was the author of Lambeth 110, uh, the bishops wrote it, but Steve Knoll was there by their side advising them how to write this. He was essentially the founder of the GAFCON's uh, Jerusalem Declaration. Now, of, of course, many well, he, people he'll deny it, it, but, but he, yeah, he, he, he was a great contributor. This is the, this is the, to, bra this is the yeah. brain. Yeah. This is the brain behind all this. Yes. And he will be going to GAFCON in uh, Kigali, uh, basically without portfolio, because he's retired now. But these 14 theses really will be an important way to help guide Anglicanism forward. Because, you know, we're seeing these issues in England and in Wales and in Scotland and in Brazil and in South Africa and Canada. And we're seeing uh, other Anglican churches arise in these places or pre or trying to contend for people. And we really basically need to have an understanding what is the Anglicanism that we're contending for? What does it mean? How do we, you know, is this just an inherited label? Or is there really something specific about the way we do church and worship Jesus Christ? So do keep watch for Stephen Knoll's work. I'm, I haven't seen it all. I've seen the first chapter of it, and I really think you'll, you'll I enjoy it, and I think you will too. In fact, uh, after the 14th one comes out, uh, I'll uh, call him up and see if we can't get an interview uh, with him. He's always a delightful person to have on the show. And uh, one of the, the, you know, there's people always ask, well, who are the great Anglican theologians? When I'd say, you know, for the last, you know, 30, 40 years, he's in the, in the, t the top brawl of who I identify as a theologian. Uh, certainly well, he's actually a church historian, but he's a historical the still historical come theologian. On, come on, for historical theologian. I love I love Stephen. No, all right. Let's look at the rest of the news here. Ah, okay. Last week or two weeks ago, um, Justin Welby, the Archbishop of Canterbury, announced that they're going to give out reparations for people who were victims of the slave trade, and. That kind of went over like a lead balloon. He has the money. 
obviously they, they can there's some account somewhere they can come up with a hundred million dollars but people will who are you going to give it to and who are the victims and when you really start going three and four questions deep so justin you're just doing this to virtual signal you don't you don't intend to do any of this do you now i want to say with clarity though we had this happen here at the national cathedral where they wanted to pay out reparations to uh, families who were um, slaves back at the construction of the cathedral and uh, White House and stuff like that. And they found some, and they did hand out money. And I was appreciative that they followed through with it, and it wasn't just pure virtual signaling. Justin Welby, on the other hand, has nobody who wants to help him, and it may go nowhere, George. Yeah, the, uh, the the secular response has been ridicule. Mm -hmm. The church response has been, you're being irresponsible. Um, from a historical perspective, when Britain freed the slaves in its West Indian plantations, they, the British government uh, compensated the slave owners. They bought the freedom of the slaves. Mm -hmm. And if anybody deserves to be repaid, it's the British taxpayer who paid out roughly the equivalent of a hundred million. Um, and it took like, you know, the government borrowed the money and it took how, I don't know how many generations to pay it all back. Yeah. But if, but if anybody is owed money, it's the British government who basically ended the slave trade. Instead of having a civil war like we did in the United States, they basically bought the freedom of the slaves. So money's already been put out by the British government and maybe you should pay that back first. Um, but then the whole issue of compensating someone's ancestors for an injustice, I think it's very problematic. It certainly is not um, something that I can basically find any moral justification for. That basically giving money from one group of people to another if you have a tangential relationship to historical tragedy. Slavery was a tragedy. More Europeans, by the way, were trafficked into slavery into North Africa than Africans were trafficked to the West Indies. Uh, do we now go after the Muslims for their slave trading and so on and so forth? Uh, these are all historical injustices. What I said in the past, I said again, if they're going to spend this money, uh, spend it on the needs of people today in the disadvantaged communities where mm, there may absolutely. be the descendants. Yeah whether it be in education, whether it be in uh, helping people start businesses, do it for people today. It, you know, you give people a quarter of a million dollars or, or uh, the city of San Francisco reparations committee, <laughs> five million. What are they gonna do with it? What are they gonna do with it? They're gonna blow it. You know, it's like you see all these articles about lottery winners within a year and a half, they're in bankruptcy and uh, because well, they just don't uh, know how to. The, the North American Indian is the exactly what we don't do uh, because they were put on plantations they're given a stipend and they're, they're given no job promotions no desire to do anything to work for uh, money or a wage and the alcoholism uh, rate on your average uh, reservation is beyond pale 90 95 percent uh the males are alcoholics because they get their uh, 800 bucks a month from the U.S. government, and that's enough to uh, uh, supply them with the liquor they need to wash away the pain. Mm -hmm. uh, so what was once a proud nation of, of American Indians here uh, wiped away because we felt guilty. We were guilty, but the answer wasn't payment. Well, and... I'll take issue with a tiny bit of issue of something you shared with Susie Leaf in your show uh, from, uh, was it Wednesday? Wednesday show. Hey, what? What, what, what did I do wrong? You said you think it's good to apologize for the church to apologize to the gay community for past injustices. I don't know if I believe that mm -hmm. because I think apologies need to come from the perpetrators, not from the institutional heads. In other words, let's say let's say my dad did somebody dirty in a business deal 50 years ago 
If I say I'm sorry to, I'm, I'm just making this up. So no. If I say I'm sorry to the son or the grandson of the person my father outdid in a business deal, does that have any meaning whatsoever other than to puff me up to show my magnanimity? To, I'm being both condescending and uh, virtue signaling. I, th I think rather than just words to say we're sorry, we were mean to you, you should actually do something without talking about it that affirms the persons that you feel that you were mean to. Because these, you know, President Obama would go on these apology tours for the United States around the world, and it meant nothing. All it did was made Obama and his supporters feel better. Justin Welby's on the perpetual apology tour and embarrassed for the uh, what the English have done. And now you're seeing the pushback. Nigel Bigger, who's a professor at Oxford, Anglican priest, has basically started written a book that just came out. They basically talked about the benefits of the British Empire for its inhabitants. Whereas the Welbys of this world talk about, oh, we're so embarrassed by the British Empire. Um, I just, I'm just not on the apology train, unless it's personal and heartfelt, not perfunctory I, and virtue signal. I'm on the apology train if it has not been done before. As a church, to apologize for a, a wrong to a group of people uh, in the past, uh, I don't think is wrong if it has not been apologized for before. Now, we have Obama take his plane when he was president of all of the country, apologizing for stuff we said sorry for before. So that, you know, I, I do have a problem with that. But uh, if we want to uh, not change our doctrine and uh, allow people to know the gospel, part of the gospel is seeking forgiveness for past wrongs. You know, yeah, but for our, my past crimes, not somebody else's. That, that's my point. And my point is if a church leader says we're wrong once, <laughs> I have no problem with that. You know, it's the continual uh, um, uh, tour, as we call it. Well, nobody's yeah. asked me to apologize for the sins <laughs> of the Episcopal Church, and so I guess I shouldn't worry about it. Yeah, you shouldn't worry. All right. Um, oh, I hate to talk about this one because we, we were kind of rooting for him, but uh, uh, Bishop-elect Charlie Holt is really going on this, uh, shall I say, apology tour, um, where he's kind of... Uh, wants to make sure that the House of Bishops approve his uh, future bishopship in Florida. And uh, I'm a little disappointed with, disappointed with what I'm reading, George. Well, uh, Charlie Holt, uh, his second election has been challenged and is going through the court processes again for essentially a spurious region. It, mm -hmm. The reason it's bullshit, excuse my mm -hmm. language. You can um, say BS, you don't, you know. BS. Okay, and he's put out a series of letters. The last one was an epiphany letter, essentially saying, I'm not a mean evangelical. I love all people. I love all things. And his latest letter, you know, he's being accused of being anti-black and anti-gay. And so his latest letter is about how he wants to set up a chaplaincy at Florida at A&M, which is a historically black college in Tallahassee. Um, and that, you know, all people are welcomed and it, that we're the loving community. And using these buzzwords to sort of get by, well, maybe I, I'm not in his shoes. I don't know what I would do if I were in his position. But it certainly is uh, looking like his, he's going to be neutered as an effective voice for reform and renewal in order to this confirmation process. But I don't know. Well, no, we do know. We've seen this before. Brett Kavanaugh nominated to be on the Supreme Court. Brett mm. Kavanaugh, basic Boy Scout, uh, you know, law professor, really uh, had experience as a lawyer, as a justice. Uh, what you really look for with a per person with jurisprudence experience the left said no way and over the course of six and a half weeks the FBI and the Department of Justice received 4200 affidavits of women that said uh, Brett Kavanaugh had in some way harassed them 
uh, or sexually harass them or held them down or you know glass ceiling them and the Department of Justice was forced to investigate all these of all those they found none that had to, to make it to um, the level of uh, the Supreme Court nomination reasonable doubt like, yeah reasonable doubt just nothing there but when you're a conservative in a liberal world in a cancel society you, you either have to make friends or you have to um, find a way to be appreciated for being against that fray and so I, I understand where Charlie's coming from I'm a nice guy type thing but that's not what the liberals want to hear the liberals want to hear I'm stepping down I can't believe how uh, my second nomination was so ruined in the election I, you know that's what the liberals want to hear well, yeah, they want him to make way for a woman or for yeah. a Mac black Mac, black per, yeah, black man yeah. or a black woman. Yeah. Uh, see, that's the wonderful way about liberals. They want to see more diversity, and they demand <laughs> it, but not of themselves, yeah. but of uh, of others. Okay, we've got a few minutes here. Let's talk about the latest terrorist attacks in Africa. Uh, they've been happening, and, and uh, people have been uh, dying. George, terrorism is ticking up. Mozambique, Somalia, Kenya, uh, Central African Republic, of course, Nigeria, Mali, and the latest outrage was this past Sunday a, uh, in Kasindi, which is a Congolese border town on the border with Uganda. Uh, a Pentecostal church was holding a baptism service on a Sunday afternoon when a bomb went off and at least 20 dead, two, three dozen badly injured and islamic uh, jihad is uh, the islamic whatever of central africa the uh, al-qaeda affiliate of central mm -hmm. africa has claimed responsibility and their goal is to destroy and drive out christians from all of central africa and east africa turn those countries into uh sharia states into little uh little uh, uh iraqs or syrias um, and the United States has uh, basically abdicated any of its uh, work in this area. Uh, you know, the, the, the uh, Biden administration reversed its stance on Nigeria's treatment of Christians. Uh, the Trump administration warned the president, Buhari, Muhammadu Buhari, that look, you know, we're watching what you're doing to your Christian uh, population cut it out or you're not going to be getting any weapons from us because we're not going to pay for you to persecute your own people oh biden reversed that and said oh there's no persecution of christians in nigeria boko haram they're more concerned they're fighting against climate change mm -hmm. not against christianity which is but of I course nonsense as ben Kwashi. Uh, <laughs> i wonder if biden yeah. invited them to davos you know so but but you know if you look at the world right now it's in pretty tough shape of course we have uh the latest news i've seen uh 150,000 dead in the ukrainian army at least 300,000 wounded mm, i don't know how many on the russian side but essentially the pre-war ukraine army is now all dead uh and it's been replaced by draftees and volunteers and militias Where's and, and, mercen and millions, mercenaries mercenaries yeah. we've seen millions driven from their homes we see that going on we see the uh uh the islamic terror wars in uh, across africa we see civil unrest in peru and in uh, chile and uh, bolivia mm -hmm. uh, and pakistan peru, is having uh, trouble yeah. pakistan Pakistan has just strengthened its blasphemy laws. It hasn't relaxed them, which the world has been asking it to do for years, but strengthened the penalties for blasphemy. And China, of course, is uh, on a path to uh, basically either browbeat Taiwan or invade Taiwan. And what what are what is our government concerned about? Um, getting rid of gas stoves. Oh no! I here's the latest headline. I, I don't know how many people uh, get late breaking headlines, but uh, uh, this morning, 
some emails broke from a, a previous Biden lawyer. It says President Biden is named in a 2017 email discussing a multi-million dollar gas deal with China. His uh, former Louisiana lawyer wrote, and uh, it talks all about Joe and uh, Hunter and other people. And do you think he'll be prosecuted for these deals when he was a vice president? No, no, not a chance. I, I don't even th I don't even think it's possible. I think he has to wait till he's out of office because I think people try to prosecute Trump for alleged yeah. wrongdoings, and they and the laws where well you have to wait till he's out of power. So you know Biden will skate, but it's I don't want to mix secular with domestic politics, and some people on who watches don't like our secular politics political views, uh, but. You know, weakness of a leader really does impact the organization. We have a it weak president of the United States. We have a weak a, Archbishop of Canterbury. It causes a vacuum. Uh, Justin no. Welby is causing a vacuum that has political ramifications around the world for Christians, uh, and mm -hmm. especially those uh, Global South leaders who need him to be uh, a powerful Christian leader. Uh, they're they're turning to him. Hey, I could call Justin and he could help me. I guess no, no. You know, he's no longer a, a resource to these people who are being persecuted, who have governments uh, coming down on them, who are being exiled. There's no and could answer. And in and into the vacuum, others will step. Uh, like there was a news article that came across the wires yesterday that Saudi Arabia is now going to start thinking about maybe we'll sell oil in something other than dollars chinese RMB, eu you know eu euros uh basically removing the the american currency as the world's reserve the petrodollar getting rid of that now why is that a big deal well the american government prints dollars for the world to spend so in essence it subsidizes our government spending by having all these foreigners want to use dollars. If the Saudis are going to take somebody else's money, that means our government's, you know, the value of the dollar gets worse and inflation gets worse here. If, you know, Justin Welby, uh, you know, has, well, let's take the recent uh, unpleasantness in Jerusalem where two teenagers uh, but broke 30 headstones and gravestones at, at the at uh, David Pelleggi's, uh Cemetery, Christ, well, not his cemetery, but Christ Church, <laughs> Christ Jerusalem, Jerusalem, yes, cemetery, Mount Zion Cemetery. Two Jewish settler teenagers, one eighteen, one fourteen. They've been arrested and charged with vandalism and religious hatred. Um, who did the Israeli government reach out to, and who were the pictures taken with? In the past, it would have been the Archbishop of Canterbury, because Justin Welby stuck his nose in this and had a big public say in all this. Was there any sort of meeting with the Israeli ambassador and Justin Welby with little pictures taken? No, there wasn't. Instead, it was the Greek Orthodox Archbishop in Jerusalem and the Isra and the Israeli police commander saying, apologizing for the vandalism and saying, we will protect Christians in the future. Now, if you don't know, if you don't have a sense for the history, and if you don't have a sense for what the uh, how the world works you would say well why shouldn't the israeli police talk to theophilus well ever since the british mandate in the 1930s it was the archbishop of canterbury who was if you will the de facto protector of christians in the middle east yep just like the russians had been at one time and before and then the french and all this and that well we had that position poof Go on. gone away yeah Mm, what a great week for news, George. Um, there's going to be a special program that you are going to record in a couple hours. Uh, stay tuned for that next episode of Unscripted. I'm Kevin Coulson. And I'm George Conga. And you've been watching episode 783 of Anglican Unscripted. <laughs>